Good day to all of you listening. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hope you're doing well, my friend. Ah, this is, I think, a new attempt at a new introduction. I just want to sound like I'm really keen on having you here. Why? I am. Please don't mistake me. I am keen on having you. It's just that I feel that sometimes the commitment of or the conviction that I have for you being here is not translated through my introduction. So therefore, I thought I'll go a little bit more over the top, over the top, and make you feel very welcome to this new episode of the Soapy Rouse Show. But why is that when you have more conviction, Sandeep, that your accent comes out? I have no clue. Maybe my education, my background. Hey, anyway, welcome uh, to the episode. It's a fantastic episode. I, if I may say so myself. I have a lovely guest on the other side, as this uh, format might be familiar to you. I do a little bit up top, like an opening act, a little bit of foreplay. Eh, this is, it's not, it's more than, more than foreplay. If you're, if, the, if you're into this, then this is the main act, pretty much. It just lasts for however long it lasts. Uh, look at the post uh, break conversation as post coital, just like, you know, talking. Um, not my guest and my post kind of thing for you uh, as an act like post. You can just like recuperate, chill out, have a cigarette and listen to this conversation. Catherine Fries, uh, Dr. Catherine Fries, PhD, is on the other side. I'll tell you more about her as the introduction part of this segment comes up in a few minutes. But before that, it's a really planned show, guys. Today's episode is really like I've got notes, imaginary notes. I have no clue where they are, which would be kind of pointless. Those are my computer notes, which I can read, not the physical paper pen or the graphite pen pencil kind of notes, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm energized because I just finished a two and a half hour session on the driving range. Yeah, not the car, the golf driving range. Had a fun uh, thing. My right hand, I feel very sort of uh, weak because I, my skin keeps peeling off. Anyway, it's a long story. My pedicure gets all, my manicure gets all ruined, so... Yeah, you shouldn't be playing with your feet, Sandeep. That's not how golf is played. Yeah, I know. Anyway, I, I've i been focusing on not being stuck in the past. Is that something that you guys are successful in not doing? Because, you know, many times you're sitting there and you're bored or you're daydreaming if you have the luxury of doing that. And you think of incidences from the past or incidents that happened to you and you cringe. Like maybe something at a... Uh, maybe, you know, you tried uh, flirting or you tried a chat, a pickup line and you got shot down. That That's a very trivial, small thing. Like I'm talking about, or maybe you um, said something uh, or you emotionally lost the plot and then you had a bit of a meltdown and then that kind of comes back. Maybe this is just very specific to me, but you might have things that are in your life um, parallels to what this is. Or maybe it, it's something that you did. Like for me, every time I... It involves my eyesight and I've fucked up, like I've dropped something or walked into something or sat on someone accidentally or when someone shook or offered a sh uh, their hand to shake and I missed it. Those things seem to get me really hard. I don't know why. And um, I think if we can have the ability to sort of forget what happened in the past because you can't undo it, uh, you can't even um, change it. Uh, more important, that's undo. Uh, change is different. But you can't even... You can't wipe it out. I mean, and a lot of times I think in this situation, it's in your head. It's a lot more in your head than it is in the people who were involved in that memory. And of course, the memory, depending on the state you're in, you can either over glorify it or you can be over critical, which I think I'm in the second group. I, I, I tend to be over critical of what I've done in the past. And uh, there are people, of course, who will over glorify. They'll probably say something which was witty, but they'll make it seem in hindsight like the most amazing thing that people fell at their feet and, you know, jerk them off or whatever it may be that gets your goat or if you don't like goats maybe that that uh, that uh, tickles your dog or which uh, kind of you know which fluffs up your shaverma whichever choose uh, you, you choose to sort of apply to your life but it's it's just one of those things that the the past does and I, I keep thinking back especially of college days you know because a lot of times um, when I think of the the, the the years that I spent abroad studying either whether it was at the University of Wales or whether it was my my, my, my um, liberal arts degree in the US um, I don't know why I said liberal arts just my college time in the US it's it's these vivid I mean it's as vivid as my memory is but I've heard that also the memory that you use to recollect these experiences in the past aren't accurate and unfactual, but they have an you know an application of your perception that you put onto it. So it's yeah, a lot of cringeworthy stuff. And uh, 
but mainly, you know, I, I, besides that, besides the idea of going back in time and reliving those experiences and those things you said, the things you should have said, the things you would have done, the things you should have done, the things you could have done, the things you might have even decided not to do instead, all these things are just fucking pointless. They take up too much room in your head. They take up too much room in your heart and your soul. And I think you should let go of them. I'm telling myself, this is a podcast, by the way, for myself, but I just happen to have a mic and a um, really amazing producer who just edits it and he puts it out for you guys but little does he know that i'm the only person listening to it right now so it's great to hear you talk to yourself like this sandeep with positive reinforcement and with a positive sense of approaching the next few days or the next minute but yeah i think this is goes a long way the thing of letting go i'm not just saying letting go of that but just forgetting about the fact that fuck it man you can't do anything about what you did when you were 16 or what you said when you were 23 or how you could have been more witty when you were 32 or how you could have even been more patient three minutes back you can't do that you can't do anything about it but you can one thing you can do is just be aware of what you did and uh, forget about that clear up that space it's like clearing up it's like control or delete or it's like select 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 and wipe that shit off your hard disk because you have limited space and you have limited emotional space and you don't want to burden it with all this nonsense of what if should have could have might be uh shouldn't have so yeah cool thanks Andy. cool no worries brah but um you know especially college um clearly going back to the same point i'm not going back to the same point i'm just talking about my dorm because this is how the thing was designed in my head to sound brah okay cool brah this is how the episode should sound because i i want to talk about this idea of how we lived when we were in, when we were younger and i think every person has to go through that right like when you're 18 your expectations from board uh, and lodge was very different you would you'd shack up in a friend's room or you would sleep on a sofa you would eat out of the sink or you would eat out of the pizza box and i possibly still do that if you're a fucking um what's the word not a sloth if you're a not even a pig. I like pigs. I realize I like pigs. But if you're uh, just a slob. No, but slob's not an animal. Okay, got it. But it's a slob and a, yeah, sloth. Mm, sloth. Sleuth. That's a detective. But it's weird how you put up with so much crap. Like when I was in Swansea, it was four other guys and I sharing one bathroom. Man, just exactly. Don't even close your eyes and don't have to imagine. It was miserable. But think of it now. Because the closest it came to that experience is when my wife and I traveled to Perth for a comedy festival. I know it sounds cool. Perth, right? Western Australia. No, fuck all. It was not cool. It was a good time doing some shows there for white people, which is, of course, amazing validation when they laugh. Joke. And I ended up with my wife and I sharing with two other comedians, but they didn't, they, 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 they kind of lied to us. They said this place has two bedrooms and two bathrooms. You and your wife take one and one bathroom and we'll take two of us will share. It was one bathroom. Oh my God, it was fucking awful. Like when you have that experience to live through every day to perform in the night, it just really takes all the funny away. You're not in the mood. You kind of are just thinking about, oh God, I hope they fucking put the toilet seat up. They're, they're filthy. Uh, not they, generally people are. I've realized that maybe American, maybe English, maybe Scotland, maybe whatever. There are certain standards that may be higher in certain countries, but if you let people and give them the opportunity to behave like slobs, oh, they do. Oh yeah, they absolutely do. And they have no uh, regard for your know, this thing. So you have to come across as an obsessive clean freak and then you have to associate with other clean freaks. So why does it have to be either extreme? Why do you have to shit on the toilet seat? Or why do you have to like be so clean that you can eat off it? Like why can't you be a decent animal in the middle and just make sure that, you know, you can uh, leave the toilet for someone else to use it the way you found it. And hopefully the way you found it was good. Yeah. So yeah, college, if you think back, it's just, man, you've sucked it up and done some shit, but you didn't think it was sucking it up at that point. You just thought, you know what? This is my situation. You'll do it. So some things are good in hindsight. Some things may be cringeworthy in hindsight, but some things, of course, you have to do to get to where you are right now. So you can look back and say, I'm glad I did it in hindsight. Yeah. Does it make any sense? Yeah. Everything you say makes sense. The reason I had this thought is because of an article I read in The Guardian. See, usually it comes at some point. It's coming a little later in the in the day. Uh, about how now in, I think, Melbourne, see how I weave that in Perth, Melbourne, which is going geographically smooth, Sandeep. Yes, I know. And I, I'm going all the way to America after this. Yeah, that's how the world spins. Uh, they, 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 the, the rental market is so fucked right now in Melbourne. Uh, Melbourne, see how I say that? You can say it there properly, Mike Melbourne, not Melbourne. Melbourne, like Bourbon biscuit. So in Melbourne, yeah. Good eye, Mike. Yeah, up, yeah. Happy bum. In Melbourne, the rental market is so uh, 
it's, it's in such high demand that this one dude has, uh, I think, put up a house on rent, two bedrooms, but can fit 12 people. Ah, you might be wondering, oh, Sandeep, your University of Wales, your Swansea days, five guys to a house, one bathroom seems luxurious. It does because there are two bedrooms, which obviously two people per room. If you go, that's four. Where do the other eight sleep? You might be wondering. Yeah, I am wondering. They sleep in these things called pods. Yeah, not like a podcast. They can't sleep in a podcast. Can they sleep in a podcast? They can sleep in my podcast because it's massive. It's space for everyone. Yeah. But they sleep in these pods which have a bed, which have a curtain for privacy, because as you do. Uh, they have, I think, Wi-Fi, which is um, more important than space and cleanliness. It has got USB charging ports. Uh, what else does it fucking I I'll enter my Google password later I'm doing a recording can't you fucking figure it out computer talking to me sorry and they have these um, pods I think eight stacked on top of each other they call it like space pods whatever the word is but pretty much it's like I don't know how tall that name so basically you crawl in and sleep and I don't think it has toilet facilities I, I wouldn't want a toilet in something like that like yeah and pretty much that's it and you, you you have to pay 900 dollars a month australian dollars it doesn't make a difference like fuck it's getting to a thing so everyone wants to be in melbourne because that's where the hot stuff is happening supposedly i'm paraphrasing the article and but they have to sort of uh, settle for this and they're happy to do it and some people say uh some people say um what song is that <laughs> some people say some people da, 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 da. some people want it all yeah alicia keys say. Yeah. And uh, the landlord is saying it's in high demand because apparently it's for backpackers. One night they can just come and leave the pod and find God or uh, do whatever backpackers do. But apparently some people live in these things up to six months. Yeah, crazy. Six months in a coffin. Guys, trust me, just end it all. You can live for permanent duration. <laughs> went a bit dark, went a bit dark. But clearly people are desperate to be amidst the action and i'm sure we'll have this concept in bangalore it's just that uh, or in india or wherever you're listening have these pod um uh, pod yeah what's the word pods <laughs> yeah so this is what's going on crazy people are spending shitloads of money and they want to be things so they don't know i mean I, I don't blame them but i'm just thinking can we come up with a better way of a mattress that sort of kind of you can just wrap around you, sleep wear, like a sleeping bag, but it's a mattress that has a bunch of things. It has like a um, bathroom fitted in, so you can just poop on the go. Like a diaper slash mattress slash workstation slash transport vehicle. It has some wheels or has it just flies. Yeah, levitating mattress. And it has other things like it has a wardrobe or you basically just peel a layer off the mattress that ends up being a sort of sustainable uh, fabric that you can wrap. And then once you wrap it around, you just press a setting on your computer and the algorithm, which is, of course, a big word. And like, algorithm, you sound like a fucker. Forget saying it. But the algorithm then, you know, based, based on what setting you choose, makes it into a dress or a um, overall or it makes it into trousers and a shirt or makes it into a suit. And then you use the pillow as maybe headwear or if it's a um, memory foam mattress now of course that memory foam <laughs> it'll remind you of what you did and it'll bring back clear factual flashbacks of what happened last night or what you did last summer or what you did last fall depending on which part of the movie you like and then for shoes what can you recommend hey do you think that we can design something like this you and i Maybe we can, right? A memory foam mattress that actually remembers and also has settings to remember or remind you of what you were and what you are today and what you potentially can be. That is a mattress, memory foam mattress. Yeah. Anyway, I think all this is doable. I think it'll first happen in um, a space shuttle. It'll happen because astronauts uh, go all the way there to space or go all the way wherever they go to the moon or to Mars. And it seemingly is to just test out new shit. I don't know if they're actually learning new stuff in space. They're just going out there to test new stuff. Like, look, what's that? You mean, let's buy space food. Let's do, let's freeze fry peas. Let's do it. And let's have these mattresses. So if you're listening, anyone of you, Neil Armstrong, I don't know if he's around. Any of you who has weak arms or strong arms, I don't care. Or if you have like good quads. What if that was his name? Neil good quads. Suits it, right? Even you Neil, you have good quads. Yeah. See? Miraculous flow today. I think if you're listening right now, you must take my idea and you should pa don't patent it because I want the patent. 
even though if you sell it in india we don't care we'll just violate every patent copyright or anything trademark and just do whatever we want with it so don't go that don't go through the trouble my friend don't go through the trouble because you will not end up benefiting from doing any of this this is a half assed attempt at the russian slash uh, south uh, bangalore slash some shitty accent anyway i'm glad um that i came up with this idea and you heard it first here only on the Soapy Rao Show. Having said that, speaking about astronauts in space, my guest on today's episode is a cosmologist. She's an astroparticular physicist. Yeah, she said she's all of it, yet none of it. She's amazing. She's done uh, so much work in this field. She spent years of her life dedicated to the uh, idea of astronomy space research what is out there what do we know what don't we know what happened before the big bang what happened after the big bang what um is out there when it comes to matter when it comes to antimatter what happens when it's dark matter with dark energy and she's dedicated a lot of her studying to that she's a professor at university of texas in austin she is of course dr Catherine fries and she's here exclusively for you on the soapy rao show so do tune in on the other side and listen to my fun conversation with this lovely human being so thank you do share it with someone who you think will like this episode i'm sure you like it so you just pass it on yeah like a chinese whisper or a hungarian um handshake whatever suits you go ahead and do it as always i appreciate you listening to this podcast goodbye god bless take care of yourselves cheers and catch you on the other side Dr. Catherine Fries, welcome to the Soapy Rao Show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm very excited uh, to talk to someone who studies space and especially uh, such a s uncharted or undiscovered part of space with such a, a vast concept. But before we get there, um, right now you're at this, I think we're at this point in time where everything is open to us right when we look at maybe the way elon musk is exploring the idea of space travel or we have all these billionaires looking at uh space travel and even with the government agencies looking at it in a different way but i think first of all maybe can we talk about how your interest in this subject developed over the past years of your career and before you got into it even so uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how far, how far back to start, but I'm going to tell you about my family when I was growing up. Yeah. And so my my parents were both molecular biologists. Mm -hmm. And actually, my father was originally a physicist. He was a student of, of Heisenberg's and uh, switched to biology, made it very seminal discoveries. Mm -hmm. And so the so science is the family business. Mm -hmm. Nice. The, so the idea, and the idea that a woman could succeed in this field was not foreign to me. Right. So my mother is kind of amazing. She was in Germany, got her PhD at twenty-two, and became a postdoc at Caltech. A woman of that generation. So, yeah. I That's pretty amazing. This. Yeah. She's pretty hard to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> so then, after that, uh, you know, I guess I wanted to be. I wanted to, to uh, write poetry as an mm -hmm. elementary school. But then when I was in high school, I took a summer school class in physics and it was, it wasn't very, it was a short class. And at the beginning mm -hmm. I was quite intimidated by it, but then I realized actually I'm pretty good at this. And more, more importantly, we did some very introductory stuff, introduction to relativity. And that absolutely got me so excited and I really wanted to learn more. Right. So when, so when I went to college, I, it takes a while to build up your physics knowledge to the point where you really do some interesting things and that I really wanted to do that. So that was, that, that was, that was an important influence on me. But then when I graduated college, cause I, at, at, uh, I was a Princeton student and it was really tough and I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do anymore by the time I graduated, honestly. So I went off to Japan and I was teaching English. I was working in bars. I was doing all kinds of stuff, yeah. taking a, a break from academics. And then I went, I ended up, getting appendicitis and in the hospital i had by chance brought one book with me and this was a book about relativity so i started reading it in the hospital right i was actually in there for a while because the appendix had started to burst you know and so then right, I, I, right. I dropped everything and took off um 
I had previously gotten into a lot of grad schools. And so I um, uh, contacted Columbia University. This is August. And they said, sure, you can start in September. So I did. So I went back <laughs> with full enthusiasm, excitement. And so, but but then it, I, I, I didn't follow standard career path in the sense that, again, I tried out, a, I'm leaving out some stages, but I tried out a lot yeah. of different things, but ended up um, as... I thought I'd wanted to be an experimentalist working at the accelerator at mm -hmm. Fermilab outside of Chicago. Mm -hmm. But from there, that's an hour outside of the city. And so I wanted some excuse to get into the city. And twice a week, I went into, in to take a class with David Schramm at the University of Chicago. He was offering a course in cosmology. Mm -hmm. And I, in fact, I stopped going into the lab and I just started reading about relativity again and cosmology and at some point uh i mean i could make this a shorter story or a longer one but basically i connected with so uh, uh, on the midterm everybody got 40s and somebody got an, an, an 80 and that was me and so he said would you like to do a project and i said would you like to take me as your student so that's how i moved into cosmology actually mm -hmm. transferred universities and and uh yeah, so I got uh, that was he was a very inspiring man, and right. that was yeah that was my entrance into cosmology. You know what's I mean? Of course, as you said, you've left out a few stages and you went uh, in various directions before you sort of made this um, decision to sort of follow cosmo uh, follow this, this this direction of cosmology. But when it comes to something like that, right? When it comes to even something as physics, which is quite vast, but it's also as you uh, said it, it's before you get to the good stuff there's a lot of prep right because I think all of us especially to a certain level have done some level of physics and it baffles a lot of us it's sort of many of us do it because it's maybe a credit or a grade and we just sort of get it out of the way but how do you um, how important is it in the in the sort of formative years of education to have a knowledge of this because there's a lot of conversation around whether is it important let kids just sort of figure out what they want to do uh, if someone has a sort of knack for the arts or for music or some sort of thing let them do that and let's sort of involve science as a, a necessity in uh, the sort of k through 12 uh, phase in, a, in in kids education so what is your thought process on that like was it really influential did you do you feel that maybe if you had stumbled upon it later on it would have been as uh, capturing for you so i think that children are naturally drawn to science and space in particular they, they're right. they're excited they look everybody's excited about astronomy at, at a young age mm -hmm. and now so here's it depends what 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 i think what country you, that you're living in as to how that develops and so right. Um, I can only speak for for in, in the United States as people they get in their heads that science is uncool, which mm. is the dumbest thing in the world. It is the <laughs> coolest, it's the coolest, most creative uh, field in the world, and they somehow that that uh, that's lost on. By the time people finish high school, I mean, actually, I went to a high school that didn't even offer physics, which is why I went to that summer school. I went to a girls' school and they didn't even offer it. So the the mm. offerings are, are are very weak. The teachers are weak. And so yeah. what I, I can just speak from my personal experience, one of the courses that I've most enjoyed teaching is it's for introductory students in university who are not science majors. And mm. I teach them a course, I've taught a number of different courses, but for example, an introductory course in cosmology, mm. and you can do it with no mathematics whatsoever. And they're so excited that some of them end up becoming physics majors. Mm. And so uh, I guess I'm, I'm, this is, I'm talking a little bit, in, not in a direct path, but I think the point that what I would like to see is introduce students right away to the modern topics that people are working on, the unsolved yeah. problems, the mm. exciting things, instead of burying them in 17th century problems. Um, I, yes, of course, you need to be able to calculate a ball rolling down a hill. And, yeah, and yeah. The basics you need to do that, sure, but why not introduce them to even uh, even at a non mathematical level to the excitement that physics has to offer as in, yeah. in terms of using your mind in an exciting way? So, so I wish I wish we could somehow bring the the uh, the, the forefront topics all the way down to even middle school. 
Yeah, because that's something which sort of sticks out for me when I think of physics class in, in, in high school. I took it up till, I think, the 10th, um, because in, in India, we don't have it all the way till 12. Like 11th and 12th is a different school or a different program. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I remember, and it it's it, nothing sort of gets, like, I don't look back going, oh, that was so exciting. Like just how you mentioned that summer school was a changing moment or uh, when yeah, you did a certain yeah. thing and because it's for me typically it was like oh you know it was tedious because when you do the refraction and the light going through the prism I'm just like man this just makes no sense because I, I don't know where the light falls on the paper to draw the mark so someone else would do that for me so the way you put it like yeah it would be I, I would have loved to I mean I'm not regretting it but I'm saying I would love to have someone come and give me a lecture or someone talk about the idea of maybe the moon landing something as basic as uh you know, just the sort of different layers of deep space or just subspace, who knows, right? There's so many things that which could have got a teenage boy's um, imagination could have captured that, but... Absolutely. So it's very sad that it's lost. And I'm saying in all aspects, right? When you think of chemistry, it's they make you memorize the formulas of the hydrocarbons. It's just like, can we do something? Like if you had introduced it in a certain way, which was like, okay, this is where the practical application can happen. And this is what your daily life sort of comes across chemistry. I think it's such an important thing that you mentioned that these things are exciting, but we kind of make a conscious effort to take the exciting out of it, right? Yeah, that's what it feels like. Yeah. <laughs> it's really sad. It's really <laughs> sad, yeah. No, so, okay, I, I, I think everyone listening right now wants to talk about the exciting stuff that you're working on. So before I get the terms messed up, so, okay, you work with dark matter and dark energy, and that falls within the realm of cosmology, or is that astrophysics? Can, because I, I, I'm going to pretend, and for the most part, I don't really know too much. So if you could just sort of start from there, maybe we can then go down the path of um, more details in that space. So, no pun intended. <laughs> the the uh, I I'm I'm happy to call myself any of these things: cosmologist or astro astro particle physicist. Okay. Because my work is really the idea of using small particles to explain the large astronomical properties of the universe. Uh -huh. Or, but but I have to say, astronomy is ah, cosmology is taking over. <laughs> so it's becoming a larger and larger fraction of what's going on in astronomy in general. So of course there are other topics that are very exciting, such as the, the this, these discoveries of all these planets. So understanding yeah. the the exoplanets that's an exciting field which carries over into life in the universe. So there are other exciting areas that are also growing, but the intersection between physics and astronomy has never been so strong. So for mm. example, uh, I'm a, a as you know I'm a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, mm -hmm. and we had a search to hire new faculty. Right. So we hired we hired an experimentalist who looks at the sky and uh, builds mm -hmm. instruments. He's uh, I'm excited that he's coming next year. And then, but then the other area we wanted was someone. Well, the, one of the things that's so phenomenal about my field is the data that are pouring in. It's some of the biggest data sets in the world. And mm. and, and and we've got new telescopes just launching. The James Webb Space Telescope just launched. The Roman telescope is going to launch and so with all this enormous data coming in we wanted to hire someone who looks at the data and looks for new discoveries within it and so on so guess who guess what the guy we really wanted the astronomy department at my university right. hired that guy right so there's so much overlap in the fields is a guy a physicist is he an astronomer i don't know he's mm. we, we, it's the, the overlap is just so immense these days you know i want to ask you maybe it's not something that is um well i'm not sure if it's popular or it's unpopular but you know you, you you're, you're so um you're so sort of ingrained in a science background your family your parents and even the people you surround yourself with um are all scientific thinkers so when when uh, when you know when when i hear of um sciences maybe or people some people call it a pseudoscience uh, of something like astrology or you look at some things like the ancient uh, cultures the way they viewed celestial movements or like you just mentioned the modern te technology we have with the new telescopes and the new sort of ways to capture uh, information from space uh, how i mean what, what do you what do you make of it like the way these uh, people who maybe our ancestors or maybe people way beyond that how do you feel they the, 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 the way they calculated certain um, things that we still use today or maybe we're realizing that oh my god it's accurate because science proves it uh, what do you make of it if if that's a space you want to go into 
Well, so in, in, in terms of astronomy, there are ancient cultures. These people were pretty smart. So I'm thinking, for example, I, in, in Mexico, I went to, I, I think it's Tulum where they have, and they, they had an observatory, you know, and these, these it's, they, they knew a lot about the sky. So mm -hmm. given, given the, lack of the, the, the lack of technology that we now have, they may do with not that much. And they figured a lot of really cool things out or going even farther back, um, the, the, the Greeks, obviously. And so historic, historically speaking, especially I think astronomy, they were, they, they figured a lot lot of things out and then the uh, revolution however came with galileo when he made yeah. the first telescope and he looked the better the technology the more you can figure out but people yeah. and and but and mathematics of course you 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 didn't you could do that without all uh, with with without um the, the technology that we have today but on the other hand mathematics and physics are so it's so interconnected that mathematics is able to pro progress also be, because we make discoveries about the physical world so yeah so so where are we right now with everything we've developed and uh with the amount of maybe knowledge or the amount of sort of uh, the tools we have at our disposal uh what's the sort of launch pad we are sitting on in 2022 right now with the possibilities that are at our fingertips so I, i'm going to talk about something sociological which is that mm -hmm. back in the day you had to either be a monk mm -hmm. or um, some a religious figure or um, later on a wealthy person to be yeah. able to devote time to these questions. Yeah. And then it became, a, they became an actual field that a normal person could go into. And so the numbers, of course, of people doing it are going up. And guess what has revolutionized the world for, for people like me is that now women are allowed to do it, mm. right? So the, the sociology of that, I mean, the number of women in my field is still very low, but it's growing. And, and mm. so I'm pretty lucky. I'm really lucky because yeah, it's a, right. I mean, I'm one experience. of the first. I'm one of the first female physics majors from Princeton University. It's so, yeah, that's that doesn't amazing. work, right? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we weren't we weren't allowed to do it. So, sociologically, being allowed to participate in this in in this, fun, it's a really fun business, you know. <laughs> and so it's really creative, and and I get to be inventive and have and and I get to work with the coolest people in the world. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't like everybody in my field, but there, a lot of them are just really fun. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Smart, and and so that so I just had to make that comment. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is, if you think about cosmology in particular, is is it's just unbelievable where the where we've come in mm. all throughout history. Let's go back to antiquity again. So people had creation myths because the, people always wanted to know where do we come from. We're, what is out there beyond that which we can immediately see? So these are questions that everybody always asked. Mm. And then along comes Einstein in 1915, allowing us to have our creation story, the Big Bang. Yeah. But the difference is that this one's correct. And think about it. <laughs> Talk yeah. about human achievement over the over the past hundred years is just mind boggling. Yeah. And it's, it's incomplete, but the basic picture is correct that we have an expanding universe. We have a okay. universe started out hot and very densely packed it's and since then it's been cooling off and expanding and yeah so the the, the amount that we understand is 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 crazy and then you know and and the it's just accelerated the knowledge has gone it's, it's insane so at, at around the turn of the millennium some of the big questions were answered about the universe such as how old is how old is the universe how much ordinary stuff is in the universe, which takes me to the dark side, the, mm -hmm. the ordinary stuff that you and I are made of and the air we're breathing and the sun and the stars and planets, all made of atoms, all consists only of 5% of the content of the universe. And so nailing down these numbers is mm -hmm. that it really is 5% of the universe. And knowing the, the the geometry of the universe, we know what that is. We know there's no curvature to the universe. It's it's a flat geometry. So the mathematics you learn in middle school holds. You don't have to learn anything more sophisticated. So really when you say NASA. flat, it's like an x and a y axis. No, I mean um, yeah. People always get confused. I don't mean that it's a two dimensional geometry. We have a obviously we have a higher dimensional universe we have three dimensions at least right. the ones we know about so there's depth as well right 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 okay yeah yes so that's not what i mean but um 
So there were, okay, so I'm going to go back to 1920 something when yeah. people took Einstein's equations, applied them to the universe as a whole with some basic underlying assumptions about the symmetry of the universe. And so when, when they realized there were three possible geometries for the universe, in one geometry, we would be living on the surface of a higher dimensional sphere. In our, the entire universe would be on, on the surface of a sphere. And I don't mean a basketball, I mean at another dimension. Okay, right. so we'd be living on the surface of a sphere. Then another possibility that would be that instead we would be living on the surface of a saddle. So that right. it's it, it wouldn't, it, so the sphere is obviously finite, but the saddle goes on forever. In, it's a weird shape, but it does go on forever. Okay. But the other possibility, the third possibility, is the one that I was calling the flat geometry, which is you take a cube, so you have x, y, and z, the three axes, but right. take them out to infinity in all directions. Right. And so the geometry on the surface of the sphere is is curved, right? So like right. a light traveling, like piece, uh, some light would move along the surface of the sphere. That's not what we're used to dealing with. Uh -huh. or on the surface of the saddle well, straight lines in these geometries are weird and the angles between in a triangle don't add up to 180 degrees if you draw a triangle on the surface of a sphere mm -hmm. in the, then the the then the lines would be distended um of the triangle and the angles in there add up to more than 180 i don't know if this is it's a little bit hard to explain in words but so the point is that we don't have curvature to the universe we don't have these weird geometries it really is more like this cube that you take yeah. out to infinity. And so the, the, the lack of curvature is what we call flat geometry. Okay. 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 That makes sense. No, I, I mean, in my, in my limited knowledge, I think I get sort of a, a semi visual of what, your, what, what, what it feels like. So it's not a, it's not something that we have in our environment, but it's kind of like the way of thinking is around um, the vastness is quite, quite immense. Right. It's just, um, and this is yeah and, it's it's hard to think about <laughs> yeah it's it's no because it's quite uh it's quite first of all um i think humbling to uh, realize that we are only five percent i mean not just you or i but everything that we know um or we try to sort of comprehend is only five percent so it, it just it's just i think that just needs a moment to itself because we we make such a big deal of the physical and we try to capture more and more of it like whether it's like someone right now sitting trying to get into land dispute saying oh it's it's thousands of acres or someone trying to annex another country saying this is our country like what's happening with russia and ukraine and then you realize all of that and that's just in one part of our planet but we take all the other planets all the other things and all the other <laughs> and that's just only five percent i think it's i think every day we need to have like a sticky note saying that i think just to put people um i think in mind of how inconsequential we are i think it's really good to have that <laughs> yeah talk about a change of world view so the yeah the, uh, i'm just i mean they, they locked up galileo because the, he didn't he was saying the earth was not at the center of the universe you know yeah, and so yeah, yeah. No, though the sun isn't either and our <laughs> galaxy isn't either yeah in fact this, i was mentioning the symmetries that they put into the equations so that they could describe the universe as a whole one of them is that there is no central point at all so all points of this are on, on the average on the large scales there's no special point in the universe so i'm not saying that all i mean obviously you and i are our own special points in the universe but yeah. on the average on large scales there, the, there's, there's, yeah, the, everything is on the average the same everywhere you look. That's the assumption that goes into the equations that we use every day to describe that which we know. And those equations apparently are correct because we're nailing a lot of predictions about the universe. It's unbelievable. Do you want to hear an amazing one? This yes. is one of the things, when I heard about this, that's why I also wanted, got interested in cosmology. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll give you an example of something that's that that I found quite remarkable. So, very early in the universe, there were quarks and leptons, very tiny particles, mm -hmm. that later got together to make protons and neutrons, which uh -huh. are the the fundamental pieces for atoms. And then here's a prediction for something that would have happened three minutes after the Big Bang. 
That was the first time that protons and neutrons could get together and make more complex objects. They made deuterium, helium, and lithium, okay? And so mm -hmm. helium, deuterium is a neutron and a proton that are stuck together. Mm -hmm. Helium has two neutrons and two protons that, okay. are, that, make, that make up an atom. And lithium is the next one, okay? And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about the details, but the mm -hmm. point is, that we are able to calculate the, exactly how much of each of these there should be that were formed at three minutes after the Big Bang. And the answer is 25% is helium-4, mm -hmm. 10 to the minus, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get the number wrong, 10 to the minus four, four is deuterium, helium-3, hel so, and then lithium is 10 to the minus 10. Mm -hmm. So those, so these numbers range over 10 orders of magnitude from 25% to 10 to the minus 10. And now you can go measure, go out there and look in the universe, how much is there of each? Mm. And guess what? They're all, it's all correct. And this is stuff that was produced. These are predictions for what happened three minutes after the Big Bang. It's called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Mm. And the predictions are correct for all of these. That's insane. And the predictions only work if ordinary matter is 5% of the total content of the universe. Okay? That's one of the criteria, right? The parameters or criteria, right? Isn't that, but isn't that crazy that we, this this was already known, I don't know, 1970s or something that mm. Big Bang Nucleus said this is works? No, so, so this is also something that happened three minutes after the Big Bang, which is 14.5 billion years back. Yes, exactly. That's pretty brilliant. <laughs> That's pretty brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. So what happened before? What was there before this? this big bang I, I i don't know if it's even a valid question so there's one thing that i always have to tell people about the big bang because in the media they usually present some exploding point and that's just really the wrong way to look at it mm -hmm. so instead imagine we have an infinite universe like mm -hmm. this infinite cube yeah and as you go backwards in time it gets more and more densely packed mm. so yeah, it's, it's contracting the opposite of expanding and when you do that, okay, every everything in this room will contract to a point. Um, probably the entire Earth will contract to a point. But imagine something that's really, really far away. So if it's an infinite universe, no matter how tightly you pack it together, it's still an infinite universe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're not packing it to a point. All that happens is that it becomes so densely packed that our laws of physics, the ones we know about at, at this point, fail. So we can't go any, we can't go. So the Big Bang is really a point in time, not a point in space. We can't describe the universe any earlier than that without a theory of quantum gravity. In other words, combining quantum mechanics and gravity. And that is a holy grail of physics. And we're not there yet. So, so we don't we have don't, the knowledge to understand what happened before. It's, uh, it's almost like... We don't have like... the knowledge to understand what happened before. And so that's all the Big Bang is. In fact, the name was invented by Fred Hoyle because he was making fun of the idea. <laughs> so... I but like it. Stuck. I like it because it's stuck. It's stuck. He just, he was just having a laugh, and now it's sort of become thing that people yeah. swear by. Like it's almost like a slogan that people run with. No, and I love that idea. Like it's almost like if we look at our timeline, it's like say 10,000 years back when, or fifteen thousand years back when the first sort of tribes were formed, and someone just gave it a name like the 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 big leap right it's actually not a big leap but it's just a point be beyond which we don't know what happened because we can't yeah. comprehend that and this is exactly yeah. what it is in in some sense yeah 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 it's true yeah so i mean That's... people try so people invent there's people a lot of people work on string theory so string mm -hmm. theory is able to combine put quantum mechanics and gravity into a, into a single theory almost because it turns out there's actually 10 to the 500 different ways to do it and mm. Yeah, that's kind of a mess. So they can't make predictions. And so it's not working out. Um, well, I, there, there are people who really believe this is it. This, this is the solution. We'll figure it out eventually. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's a struggle. So going and then the other possibility that people imagine is, for example, in string theory, in addition to the three, the three dimensions we know about the X, Y, Z, or whatever you were calling it earlier, in addition to those three dimensions, there would be, an, the, the number of dimensions is actually 10, okay? So there's, there's these other spatial dimensions that we're not um, privy to. Mm -hmm. Most of them are really, really tiny. So we don't fit, we can't go there. So oh, it's like, okay. so imagine a carpet with some weave on it and you don't even see the weave because it's just too tiny. 
Okay, so that's both of the extra dimensions. However, it's possible some of them are big, and then our universe could be a membrane, like like the surface on on a drum, that is embedded mm. in, in in this other dimension. I'm just gonna let's just have one extra dimension. So, and then somewhere else is another three dimensional surface. So what ha what if in the past you had two of these surfaces collide, and that gave you the heat, the the, the high energy that the so the, the the hot Big Bang is because the universe started out hot, and so what if that's where the heat came from? So these are the kinds of ideas play, people play around with these ideas, but not at this point possible. So is that is that where the entire uh, possibility of a multiverse arrived? Uh, arised from like when people say there are these different dimensions interacting with these membrane like uh, sort of concepts is that where so sort of some speculation begins there you know there's two origins for for people taking the multiverse seriously and one of them indeed is string theory mm. which is because there are 10 to the, the there are 10 to the 500 vacua, so lowest energy states that the universe could be living in. And in other words, 10 to the 500 different universes. Mm. And we are in only one of them. And so the yeah. idea would be that these other universes are also out there. Mm. And uh, so then why does, and then, well, there are a lot of things we don't understand about our universe. Why does the electromagnetism have the strengths that it does? Mm. Okay, so there's a number associated with when a proton and an electron go by each other, how that interaction is characterized by a number. So why is it that number? Mm. And the same thing for all, the, there's four fundamental forces and there's numbers that you associate to each of them and one of them is stronger than the other. Why? So we don't know the origin of these numbers. So people speculate that, well, one possibility is those numbers are connected to the size of the extra dimensions actually. Mm -hmm. Or the other possibility in the multiverse world is that every one of these 10 to the 500 different types of universes would have different numbers associated mm -hmm. with them and so we have to live in the in in the if the strength of, ele of electromagnetism were different by a tiny tiny amount our atoms would fall apart okay so we need exactly these numbers to be exactly what they are so th this is an anthropic principle that we can only live in a universe where these numbers are of all the universes out there of course we live in the one that we're suitable that is suitable for us, for our existence. So it's almost like I, an I, environment I, where you can breathe in the air and the water kind of thing, but in a different set the, of parameters. Yes, it's like, why do humans live on Earth? Well, because, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but on the but I find it very disquieting. I want to understand. I want to understand all these things. I don't want to just argue. Yeah, well, it just is the way it is. I find yeah. that I, I'm not. I don't like that. But there's a lot of smart people who are trying to figure out, okay, of all these universes, what are the odds that we would be in this universe and, and so on and so forth. So, but anyway, th that's the kind of thing people think about. Yeah, if that multiverse theory is right, then that whole Miss Universe pageant holds no sway, right? Because it's, it's, <laughs> it's just a waste of time. But uh, anyway, jokes apart, I, I just wanted to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this whole dark energy thing right because you spoke about how these like small differences in calculations can send the entire sort of way our protons and neutrons and electrons interact but i think it's amazing how this invisible if that's the right word or this unaccounted for energy has been there and has been controlling or has been directing the way in which the matter that we can see or can feel has been functioning for years and now we're finally trying to where the cusp of understanding not even understanding maybe but maybe just discovering its existence so how does how did that sort of become your focus and how is that influenced the way you think about life and and the material world so the there's two types of matter the ordinary matter which is five percent and the dark matter which is 25 percent and mm -hmm. the definition of matter is that it is gravitationally attractive so can i do an uh, can i do a bit of an aside and and just talk about the the dark matter for a second to, yes, to differentiate it from the dark energy yes that okay. would be lovely yeah well so let's let's talk about our galaxy as an example so at the center of our galaxy, this is kind of fun. There is a giant supermassive black hole that weighs 4 million times as much as the sun. 
And the Nobel Prize was given for that discovery a few years ago to Andrea Gitz and Reinhard Gensel. Mm -hmm. So we know about that thing that, that beast at the center, but then coming out from that, it's like a pinwheel spiral arms of structure. Mm -hmm. And it's along there that all, that all the stars are sitting pretty much along these spiral arms, including the sun. Right. And so we are, we're 25,000 light years away from that central black hole. So we don't notice it is, its existence, to be honest. It's a cool thing, but it doesn't matter to us. Right. And by the way, the, the, these supermassive black holes have nothing to do with, they're, they're, they're not making up the dark matter. They're irrelevant to the total mass content of the universe. They're just cool objects. But anyway, so mm -hmm. you go out along these pinwheels and you get to the sun and all the other stars. Um, but then it, you can imagine looking at it from the side, this, this pinwheel, mm. and what's what's missing in that picture is that there's a whole giant spherical thing way way bigger than this little pinwheel that surrounds every surrounds this everything from this black hole on out and that's where most of the mass of the galaxy is 90 percent of it and that's made of that's made of dark matter and so if it's if dark matter is made of little particles which is what we think then there could be billions going through your body every second Mm. and they're very weakly interacting and uh, they don't feel the weak well, the, well anyway they, they they just go through you on the whole occasionally hitting one of your nuclei once every month or something and it's irrelevant which is why they're hard to find but anyway so that's the dark so the point i was going to make about the dark matter is that it's gravitationally attractive in fact that's how galaxies formed in the first place the dark matter collected together to make proto-galaxies, which merged together to make galaxies. And without the dark matter, galaxies wouldn't even have formed yet. And then the ordinary matter goes along with the dark matter. So dark matter is pulling the ordinary matter around. So, mm. so, this, so, so ma matter is gravitationally attractive. And this thing we call dark energy has the opposite behavior. It's, it's something repulsive. Okay, So it's completely different. And until the turn of the millennium, more or less, People would never in a million years have thought this that there that this this thing we now call dark energy would be there. So people, in fact, into the equations was built a minus sign that we thought, yes, the universe is expanding, but that expansion will eventually slow down. Right. So, so the people define a parameter with a minus sign in front, the deceleration parameter, you know. Mm. Well, guess what? It looks like the opposite is happening. The universe expansion is accelerating. That is just so unexpected. So bizarre so weird so on the theoretical level completely unexplained that it was it was really kind of yeah it's crazy and the, the, it was discovered because you have these distant exploding stars called supernovae mm. and you know how bright they're supposed to be they're very well understood objects well but they look dimmer and so the idea is they're dimmer because they're Probably. so rapidly leaving leaving us you know right, right. so so that's how it was originally discovered but at this point, it's like a, a jigsaw puzzle, and there's so many pieces of observational evidence from oh, from the behaviors of galaxies, from the behaviors of clusters, from the uh, the cosmic microwave background is a really big part of that, which is the leftover light from the Big Bang. So all of these different data sets are put together, and this picture of 5% ordinary matter, 25% dark matter, and the rest being dark energy is very persuasive and it's 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 just really it's a tough one dark energy is impossible to explain now the only other possibility is that somehow we got we have to modify einstein's equations which is a tall order i've tried to do it as well and mm -hmm. that you only have ordinary matter and dark matter and somehow the the equations explain the, the, the difference comes not from some kind of new material, but it comes from a change in the equations. So anyway, as you can tell, this is a, a subject that confuses us all. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not qualified to even calculate anything, but I'm just trying to understand it from a perspective. So from what you said, like if you look at it as a painting, then the dark matter is the canvas and the actual painting is the physical matter that we know of because without the canvas you can't have a painting it's almost like that kind of context but i'm just baffled by this i mean and the the matter that is um the en energy being created by dark matter is dark energy which is propelling this well, no, 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 no 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 dark dark matter and dark energy are different things so that's right okay. i think that's the right word dark, dark the word dark in front just means they're not giving off light 
Right. To, okay. Right. One is not creating the other. No. It's okay. It's so not, it's not okay. It's not cre creating the other. Okay. No. So what is creating dark energy? Like it's what is uh, creating this this yeah, force? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I can tell you what theories people have. None mm. of which is none of which was working that well. Mm. One of them is that in addition to the matter and radiation that we know about, that there is a lot of vacuum energy, mm. and so the vacuum energy it, that's a real thing. So in this room or in your room, there are pairs of particles and antiparticles that pop into existence and then disappear again. Mm. So they, they so an electron and its antiparticle, they come into existence and then they, whoop, they annihilate with each other, they're gone again. Okay. And they only last 10 to the minus 43 seconds, okay? Mm. And this is, this is actually happening and you can actually, it's pretty amazing, you can measure it. There's, it's, yeah, isn't it crazy? So if you have two ten to the parallel, minus forty three, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you have these, but you have if you have two parallel plates uh, yeah. of conducting material or whatever, then the force because oh, due to this vacuum actually attracts them together, and that ah, has okay. been, that has been measured. It's called the Casimir effect. It's been measured. Isn't that crazy? So vacuum, this idea of the this quantum mechanical vacuum is real. Mm. It's been measured. Okay. So, but the but the thing is, if you then do the calculation based on quantum mechanics for how much vacuum there there should be based on the particles that we know about ah, the answer is so enormous it's a factor of 10 to the 122 too large so you put the 122 in the exponent in other words it's a 10 with 122 zeros after it that's how much it's too large so this Kelly, it's called the cosmological constant problem because quantum mechanics is failing us here. <laughs> the number is too big. So mm. yeah, so if you add up all these vacuum energies of all the particles, it, you, you don't get the right answer. So mm. that problem's been around for I don't know decades, and people assumed the solution would be that something is driving that number to zero, you know. But here mm. we are, all of a sudden, in this weird situation where. To explain the dark energy, instead of having it be, it's, it's, it, it, it's not the very large number, but it's not zero either. It would yeah. be some really tiny number. Mm. So what the heck is going on? How did you, what's the origin of this tiny number suddenly? So that really doesn't make any sense. And this is one of the things that people claim, aha, you need a multiverse. And we happen to have this value because otherwise we couldn't exist. So that's, so, but, so the that. This idea of the vacuum energy, that's the one that people take the most seriously. But guess why? Because if you postulate this very small vacuum energy, it also matches the data better than anything else. So it's like, but, what is going on? Ah! So because it's not understood, it's just, okay, you know what? Because of lack of any other options, we'll just make this fit our theory kind of thing, right? Yeah. Well, no, so, no, no. I mean, this, it's... Yeah, you, you, so, I mean, people have tried a lot of different things. So instead of having a constant vacuum energy, it could be a time-changing vacuum energy. Okay. But one, th oh, one thing I can tell you is, I, I forgot to mention this, is that early, right after the, in the very early days of the universe, the very hot early days, mm -hmm. of all the pieces of the universe, it was the... Um, relativistic particles that dominated we call it radiation okay so it was the, all the particles quarks and leptons were moving really really rapidly mm -hmm. and then later on as they cooled off and they made neutrons and protons and so on then the universe became matter dominated that was the predominant constituent of the universe was matter and it's only very recently that this vacuum has become the dominant component the 70 percent so if you go back not very far then you'll find that Actually, the vacuum, so the, this constant vacuum energy started, all the other pieces became less and less important, and suddenly the vacuum pops up its head and said, hi, here I am, I win. <laughs> now, so, okay, so if, if, okay, if, we, if we understand it as a vacuum energy, and just a quick thing, I mean, I, I know, of course, there, there are different names for it, but is dark matter the same as antimatter? No, it's not. It's that's not the a same. Good, that's, no, but it's a good question. Okay. The so all the particles that we know about. Let's go to the ordinary map. Ordinary particles. Yeah. So they all have partners. So, for example, the proton has the antiproton. Right. And also, um, every single one of the ordinary. So and so the antimatter has 
all the same, it's pretty much the same properties as the matter, except for two things are different. No, it's the other, but, oops, I'm saying the other way around. It has the same mass and spin, at the matter and the antimatter, but all the other properties are opposite. So for okay. example, the proton is positively charged, the antiproton is negatively charged. And all mm -hmm. the other numbers that the, that we associate with, they're, they're all opposite. So, okay. so every particle has an opposite, except it has the same mass, okay? Mm. But and so when they and so when matter and antimatter collide among themselves, they annihilate, which means that energy from the proton and the antiproton turns into something else. So you mm. could you could create other, which is what happens at at the particle accelerator in CERN, in Geneva and at CERN. They're colliding two protons yeah. together. And, but if you collided a proton and an antiproton together, then you could create something new. So is that what happens? You said when. Um you know, that experiment or they could measure the vacuum energy when these two states collide. Is that similar? Yes. Okay. Yes. So in the, okay. in the vacuum energy, you have a, a particle antiparticle pair that come into existence, don't last very long and then and annihilate again, disappear again. Mm -hmm. So that does, okay, no, because the reason I, I brought it up is because there is, because as, as everything that we sort of, there is, what you just mentioned is fascinating, right? Just to discover this potentially unknown um, energy or a source or whatever the, the word is. But of course, as human beings, we want to know next, how can we understand it better? But more importantly, how can we harness its true powers, true potential for our benefit, right? So in that, in that, in that context, I remember reading a couple of things. Maybe, I, I don't know if it's an actual... Uh, article or maybe it was in a book somewhere maybe it's a piece of fiction where people can harness dark energy or some form uh, of the energy coming from matter and antimatter uh, to for space travel or for sustaining life on different planets so is that um think oh maybe if that's too we made up a question maybe how how can da understanding dark matter dark energy um help human beings my, um, I don't know, but okay. my, the, the big picture answer I would have is in, every time there are major advances in science, it always affects our daily lives. And right. it's, it's, it's the, I don't know that I mean, there's no way one could have predicted that at Bell Labs, I don't know what they were playing around with, but suddenly due to their discoveries that they, 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 the transistor was invented, you know, yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, weren't, yeah. they weren't looking to, to do electronics. They were just doing some fundamental science and there you go. That, 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 that there's nothing that changed the world more than that. Yeah. Or yeah, I, you can give tons of examples like that. So it's, it's the unexpected, the serendipity of discovery that, that we can't predict, but mm. I can tell you that the idea of, Oh, in Star Trek, they have, matter they storing matter and antimatter and and i don't know what they're doing with and they're colliding it to get yes you could get tons of energy out from matter antimatter collisions absolutely mm -hmm. but there's i don't know how you're going to store the antimatter because it's going to annihilate with its container right? ah, exactly because so, it's, so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's definitely science fiction yeah does that mean no, somebody but... will, won't figure it out down the road i don't know so what is the the, the the mindset that keeps someone like you going in this field which is so vast and it's not bound by results in five years or ten years it, it's just so deep into the future so what's the kind of thing that you approach your work with the oh but that's not true i only okay. a, a, a lot of the things that i work on makes are make it makes predictions for these for upcoming data sets okay so for okay. example on the on the Dark in the dark matter puzzle. Uh -huh. I, I I mentioned that we think it's some kind of fundamental particle that hasn't yet been discovered. Yeah. And so I made, so I made some predictions. Well, what if it's a weakly interacting massive particle, the WIMP? Then how would you go look for that? And mm. um, this is work that I did. Mm, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago now, but <laughs> 20, in in the 1980s. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And the uh because of our predictions people actually started building experiments so they built detectors and it's a worldwide search now to look for the wimps when they hit a detector then they give a little bit of a, a kick to the detector and they, this people are trying to detect this energy deposit 
And so this has been, it's a worldwide effort to look for that. And ah, it's frustrating. It hasn't been easy. And so, because like I said, there's a billion going through you every second you don't notice. That's how, so you have to put these detectors deep underground. And so they go in, in, in abandoned mines or then they'll go underneath mountains. And there's only one experiment that ha that's claims to see something. The other guys don't see it. And so there's a big debate what's going on. And so there, so anyway, so that was one of the things that I worked on was making predictions. Hey, this is a really highly motivated candidate. And, and here's what you, here's how you would go look for it. And people are doing it. Okay. So that's, mm. so I'm happiest when there is, well, is that true? Do I? Yeah, I, I mean, I like to make connection with with experiment actually or observation. And in fact, yeah. this I mentioned this guy at UT Austin that we hired this experimentalist mm -hmm. looking at the leftover light from the Big Bang. Well, one of the reasons I want that field to that field is really is is just been amazing. It's been one of the main tools for learning all these properties of the universe, like the geometry of the universe. We learned yeah. from that. But we're also um, going to be able to test theories of the first. 10 to the minus 35 seconds of the universe called inflation, where you also had an accelerated period of expansion. And so I have a model called natural inflation and these data are gonna test that model. How cool is that? Like that, that's yeah, getting, that's so I getting... Wanted, or I invented, you're getting me on a roll now. You wanna hear the other thing that I'm waiting for? Of course. Dark stars. We invented dark stars on the theoretical invention, you know? Mm. Um, I like to be creative and think of things like this. Boy, that was fun. My collaborators and I had such fun. So what is a dark star? Is it, it's, it's obviously sounds like something out of Star Wars, but um, <laughs> it just sounds fantastic. Oh, well, so these, the first stars that ever formed, and that would have been 200 million years after the Big Bang, they could have been powered in a very different way than today's stars. So today, stars have fusion in their core with hydrogen fusing together to make helium. Right. Imagine instead you have a very, very early star that is powered by dark matter. So the same dark matter annihilation, the dark, the, the dark matter, that the energy that comes out of that heats up this star. And so it's a completely different power source, a completely different looking star. Mm. It's they're, they're giant puffy beasts. So the size is the, the distance between the earth and the sun. They're 10 times as, as big as that in terms of size. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're cool and they can grow until they reach a million times the mass of the sun and a billion times as bright as the sun. They, they would have only existed in the early universe. So this telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, that is just going to start taking data and just launched last month, has the may be able to find these. So that's... Well, that's fantastic. I mean, is that a still? Oh, I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't imagine how uh, much you must be looking forward to this information that it's capturing. But so, is there even a, a validity in a question like, "What's the future for our universe?" Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, are we going to get it right when we play around with these? I'd love to play around with ideas like this too. If I don't right. only work on things that have immediate. Um, detectability, but also on things like questions like that. So that's really fun to think about. So, um, well, one of the interesting questions is, can life survive into the infinite future? Mm -hmm. Because the universe, if you think about it, is cooling off and it's expanding. So does that mean right now it looks like we're going to end in a big chill, everything getting colder and colder and darker and darker, and maybe even black holes being shredded apart that we don't know. Mm. Depends on what kind of vacuum energy, but um, so the long term doesn't look too good. But well, of course, it's not good for people. But maybe you could have some kind of the important thing is information. So it's it's like clouds that are somehow containing bits of information and communicating them with each other. And so um, yeah, people have people thought about that. We thought about that also. And believe it or not, the thing that becomes problematic for life in the long term is that what somehow you have to metabolize in order to stay, to keep life going, which means that it actually heats up this mm -hmm. cloud of stuff or whatever. And the question is, is it ever able to cool off again? Okay. And, and so that depends on the nature of the dark energy. 
if it's a vacuum energy, then eventually you never you, you won't be able to cool off enough anymore because the vacuum has a heat associated with it. It's called mm. a Hawking. It's a Hawking temperature. It's similar to the black hole evaporation. The the vacuum energy also has some. So you so that it's actually a heat death that you would experience. Mm. But if you have a cooling off, if the vacuum energy is, is decreasing in time, or you have some of my my ideas that I had for uh, changing Einstein's equations instead of having any vacuum at all, mm. then it's possible that you could keep you life could could survive indefinitely. So, yeah, these are fun things to play around with. But yeah. um, you know, it's, do we really know what we're doing? Thinking about the infinite future? No, of course not. But boy, is it fun. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it must be quite fascinating just working with these things. But I think as as a lot of us do, we try to think within our context because I think a lot of the things you said are fascinating and I find them fascinating. But a lot of people are like, yeah, yeah but how does it affect me in the next 20 years, right? Like when we hear the entire sort of conversation about climate change, about the planet going into a heat sort of phase and all yeah. of these various things. Uh, frightening super frightening yeah. yeah so yeah maybe before we wind up because you have such a large amount of information about things that a lot of people can't even fathom in their daily lives but when it comes to your environment around you what is what are your what's your take on that because i think it's really important to hear from someone like you about it so you're not talking about how my work affects people on a daily basis because we already talked about... Um, yeah, yeah. No, what I mean is what is your take on everything that's going on as a scientist in the space of cosmology? What's happening with our environment, with the planet, with space travel, with potential technology in that way, in that in that direction? Just just your take on that. I, not, not, not with your work, but just as someone who's... Okay. Yeah. So I've also done some work on um climate science um not much but I, I delved into that about some time ago and i have to say it's really frightening this the the uh, climate change the global warming i mean it's real we better deal with it mm -hmm. so i do suspect we're going to pull up every bit of carbon that we can out of the earth so we're going to have to mitigate the effects right sad but true i think that's what's coming and for god's sake Oh, here's an opinion that I have that pe people don't think about enough. For God's sake, what's wrong with nuclear power? Please, mm. please. We should have. I remember when I was in college, they wanted me to sign anti-nuclear power stuff. And I'm like, no, we should be pumping money into it so we can clean it up. We, yeah. This is so obvious that there's, there's a huge amount of power sitting there. And of course, it has to be run very carefully and mm. ideally there are attempts to do things where you recycle, that you don't produce as much radioactive garbage, where you can recycle it and use it again. And so we should be throwing money at this problem. And we, were, we could have gotten farther than we have so far. So I think it's a tragedy that yeah. everybody was more comfortable putting out C, car, this CO2 into the atmosphere and, and, and avoiding this, this alternative answer, which I think is... So anyway, that's, that's my, as a physicist, that's my take. What about electric power? Uh, do you think what um, someone like, you know, what Elon Musk is driving for is uh, sustainable when it comes to these batteries everywhere, these battery packs with uh, powering your homes, powering your cities, powering your transportation? Um, because I've, I've heard as well, I mean, the nuclear thing can really sustainably, not just maybe not sustainably yet, but can really power our planet and we have the technology if it's a little more fine-tuned but what 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 is your take on the electric uh conversation so you know i'm not i'm not an expert so i, I okay. don't know but my but from what i understand i mean you have to have you, it's the so the power still has to come from somewhere right so yeah. it does i don't see it solving the problem completely i guess it's better but i don't really know i don't want to speak about things I know too little about. Yeah. But one thing I don't, I don't understand these is the idea of solar power, how that's going to really work in the long run, because there's a certain amount of power coming out of the sun, and that's the maximum you can get. And is that really enough to power the Earth? I don't think so. Hmm. But 
Wasn't yeah. there talk of people putting shields or these reflectors closer to the sun in some form of space launch so that we can harness that for the planet's power? All right, now, that, now you're talking. I mean, this is more sci sci This is this is more off in the future, but that that's the kind of thing you got to do. Yeah, okay. Right, right. We got we got to think big. We really do. No, I think our, it's it's yeah. fascinating because it's just so much possibility out there, but at the same time. Clearly, we need to take something uh, more drastic when it comes to the immediate future. But um, no, I think Dr. Catherine Fries has just been fantastic. Just trying to process everything you've been saying, and uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone is listening right now. Really, I think is excited at the same time. Um, I'm honestly uh, quite bewildered by the fact that you know we, um, as people who live for eighty to hundred years, can even think of something which is so fascinating. So I'm quite impressed with uh, human beings. And I think, thank you for uh, doing all the work it, that you're doing and taking the time today to share it with uh, me and everyone listening. Well, I wanted to thank you because you, you um, I think you digested everything I was talking about really quickly and turned it into a, a language that people under connect with. And I Thanks, think, I tried yeah, to. <laughs> well, that was fantastic. So thank you, thank you so much. No, I, I really appreciate it. And I, I, I wish you all the, the best with the research and your um, projections and the models that you're making. And I think the work is fantastic. And I, I look forward to, you know, uh, reading your name in a ma massive uh, discovery in the near future. Oh, well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. We shall see. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you so much.